Yeah, the best part about the having to come up and speak after being a member is you can say whatever you want. <laughs> um, so if you just join me with a moment of prayer quick before we get started. Uh, Father God, I thank you so much uh, just for this opportunity, God. God, I just am blown away um, by just a chance just to, just to speak what you've laid on my heart lately and just uh, what you've been showing me. And God, I pray that this morning that um, the words that I say aren't mine, but they're yours, Lord, and and that they'll, they'll bless the people here and that um, they'll grow closer to you through this today. In your name I pray. Amen. So have you ever been stuck before? Because uh, I've, I've been stuck a lot of times. Um, I get my car stuck. And this one time, I got my arm stuck. Uh, you see, at Beamer, they had this really tall like metal slide that was like really rickety and straight death. And it was lots of fun. And for some reason, they got rid of it. And uh, they put in this really small slide that had these bars on top, so that way you wouldn't fall over. And so, I don't know what we were doing, but I stuck my arm through these bars, and it, when I went to pull it out, it was stuck. I couldn't get, I couldn't, it went in just fine, but it wouldn't come out. Um, but I don't know if you ever had that moment where like your heart just like sinks, and the whole world ends in that time. Because <laughs> uh, I was just running through my head, I was just thinking, oh man, like, I'm going to starve to death out here, or they're going to have to chop off my arm. Like, <laughs> I'm stuck. And uh, so a teacher came and was pulling on my arm, and, you know, it was stuck, so that hurt a lot. And so I started crying, and I was freaking out. Um, and then finally another one of my teachers came, and they put some jelly, a petroleum jelly on my arm, and pulled it out, and it's fine. Yeah, that's only happened twice. So. <laughs> uh, now, it was, it was kind of funny, but it was really painful. Um, but it's not the only way that I've gotten stuck before. Um, in my Christian walk, I get stuck all the time. I get stuck into sin. I get stuck in this meteorocracy with my relationship with Jesus where I just kind of coast, and I think I'm just kind of staying the same, but really I'm kind of just backsliding and going backwards. And I also get stuck with burdening myself with things that just, like, aren't true. Um, or I take truths about God, and I twist them in my head and kind of don't really understand what they're about, and I burden myself with them. And one of those things that I burden myself with is obedience. And so God's been showing me a lot about that lately. Um, I just kind of want to share with you guys. And so today I'm going to talk about what it is, um, what are some of the things that God asks us to do, commands us to do, um, why we do it, and kind of why we don't do it. And then what its, what its true purpose is. What's the true purpose of obedience? Because um, I feel like we kind of lose sight of that sometimes. So obeying God is a, is a pretty simple concept um, when you kind of look at it like that. It's just you just do what God says. It's kind of like with your parents. They say, go clean your room. So you go clean your room. Okay, I obeyed my parents. Pretty easy. Um, so how do we know what God tells us to do? Well, it's in this book. Um, it's about everywhere. You could probably buy it pretty cheap. Um, probably get it for free if you ask. Um, and it's, a, it's God's love letter to us. It's a guide to our life. And everything is in here. You just have to look. And so if you'll open your Bibles with me this morning, we're going to start in Matthew 5, in verse 21. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament, so it should be pretty easy to find. Um, and what I want to talk about here is that obedience is more than just like physical actions. Um, it goes beyond what, what you can see. Um, and so we're going to start in verse 21. It says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder is liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, You are good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. And we're going to skip here and go to verse 27. And it says, you have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I got to turn the page. I should have done that earlier. And this is Jesus talking here in this passage. And these two statements, the ancients were told this, but I tell you this now, uh, are really, really interesting. Because um, Jesus is showing us that God looks at so much more than just the action, but also looks at the heart um, and the inside stuff that people can't see. 
So like if we look at murder, like murder is obviously very visible. I can see it. You know, guy's got a knife in him. I know something, something went wrong here. Um, anger is a little different. It's a feeling. It's an attitude. Um, I can't really see it. I can maybe see like the expression on your face that like you hate my guts. Um, but it all, not all the time. Sometimes people are really good at hiding their anger. And somebody can be angry at me for years and I could never know it. Um, and Jesus is stating here that our, our unrighteous anger makes us guilty just like murder makes us guilty. And in a similar way, he's talking about adultery here. And again, adultery is a very visible thing. You know, I can catch somebody in it. I can see it. But lust is a little different. It's something I can't see. It's on the inside. Somebody could be lusting all day long and no one would know. But Jesus puts lust and adultery on the same level in verse 28. He says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He's calling them equal here. And so I'm challenging you to see that God cares about the action in the heart equally. He cares about the outside stuff and the inside stuff equally, just as much. Um, the external, internal, the same. In Proverbs 16.2, it says, The ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs his motives. And so when I think about that verse, I think if it were up to me, everything that I do would be clean. It'd be awesome. It'd be right. But God looks at so much more than my actions. He looks at my, at my motives. He looks at the, the reasons why I do things. So even if I'm doing something good, I can still do it for the wrong reasons. Some of the things that God uh, tells us to do, um, and you don't have to turn here, but Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40. Um, the, Jesus, uh, the Pharisees asked Jesus this question. The Jesus, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, they say, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And that makes a lot of sense to me that, the, that everything depends on them because if I love my neighbor, I'm not going to murder him. <laughs> I'm not going to be like, I love you. Yeah. Um, Jesus said, also said, go and make disciples of all nations. And Paul talks about in Corinthians that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And so if I'm loving my neighbor and I'm loving God the way God tells me to, I'm fulfilling all the law and the prophets. And if I'm going and making disciples and I'm doing the ministry that God has given us, the ministry of reconciliation, I'm, I'm doing a lot of what God tells me to do. There's a little more involved in that, but that's synopsis of the majority of what he tells us to do. And so my question is, are we really obeying God or are you doing like me and just kind of saving enough face to appear pretty decent? Because I do that a lot. Because God cares about the heart behind things just as much as the action. So why should we obey? Why do it? What should our motives be if they're so important? And I, I believe there are, are major and kind of secondary reasonings to why we obey. Our first and foremost primary reason is because we love Jesus. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And this is where, you know, we're, we're, sometimes we're so thankful, we're so in love with Jesus and his, his sacrifice for our sins that, that all we want to do is serve him. And I, I can relate to that. When I first became a believer, it's just like, oh my gosh, like this is so awesome. I can't believe what Jesus did for me. And all I wanted to do was just serve him. But there are times in my life where I'm not feeling in love with God. And I think I confuse this idea. And I know it's kind of common to do this where you confuse the feeling in love with what love really is. Because love isn't just a feeling, it's also a choice. And it's so much more beautiful as a choice. Jesus chose to love us when he died for us. It says that um, in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us um, in that he died for us while we were yet sinners. In the same way, even when I don't feel in love with Jesus, I don't feel that way. I'm not head over heels like, oh my gosh, Jesus is awesome. I still choose to love him by doing what he tells me to do. So love is a choice. And there are other reasons why, why we obey. And they're not really, they're not wrong, um, but they're there. And usually they come into play when I, in this time when I'm not feeling head over heels in love with Jesus. And usually they lead me to my prior, primary motive, which is love. 
And so I just have a couple of them here, and I'm sure there's more. Um, but these are just the two that I have. The first one is fear. Um, and I feel like there's, there's two different fears that the Bible talks about. There's this reverence, this awe of who God is, where we're just like, God, you're so holy, you're so perfect, I just want to worship you. But there's also this fear that's terrifying, that makes us afraid. In Hebrews 10, it talks about that it's a terrifying thing to be thrown into the hands of the Lord, and it is. So take a look at me here real quick with, uh, in Deuteronomy 28. We're going to stay here for a while. Um, in verse 15, Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament, um, and it's in the beginning, kind of, but not really. Uh, so if you just want to look there, that'd be great. Okay, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. But it shall come about, if you do not obey the Lord your God, to observe to do all his commandments and all his statutes, which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And this is Moses talking to the Israelites. And some of these things are, are really specific to Israel, um, but the application is still the same. And there's this huge list. I mean, he just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on about all these horrible things that will happen to Israel when they don't obey him. And they did happen, if you read the rest of the Old Testament. But these, are, these verses are talking about the consequences of not following God. It's this, this fear of, of discipline, um, this fear of, of this correction with God. Because discipline isn't very much fun. I don't know if you ever got spanked like I did when I was a kid. Um, but... Discipline's painful. It's, it's, it's not fun. So this fear of consequence also keeps me in obedience to God. And I have a, a pretty good example of this. Um, and don't turn here, but in, uh, you can later if you want, I guess. But Proverbs 5, verse 23 um, is a verse that means a lot to me. Because uh, when my wife and I, when we were dating... Um, before we were even engaged, we were in sexual immorality. We were having sex outside of marriage. It was wrong. Um, and Proverbs 5, verse 23, is one of those verses that God used to lead us, especially me, uh, to purity. And uh, in Proverbs 5, 20 through 23, he's talking about adultery and why we shouldn't go to the strange woman. In verse 23 specifically, he says, he will die for the lack of instruction and in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. And this verse terrified me. I was afraid. I didn't want to go astray. I didn't want to die for the lack of instruction. But because I was afraid, it l reminded me of how much I really love God. Because in the greatness of his foolishness, he will go astray. I'm like, man, God, I'm just being stupid here. I don't want to go astray from you. You saved me. You love me. You brought me out of all this horrible things. I can't believe I was about to do that. I'm sorry, God. I, I want to love you. I will choose not to do this because I love you, and I don't want to go astray from you. And so this, a healthy attitude of fear always leads us back to love. Okay. Uh, another kind of secondary reasoning as to why we obey God sometimes, especially when we're not head over heels in love with him, um, is also in Deuteronomy 28 verse uh, 1 through 6. And I like to call this like kind of the incentives. It says, Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country, and blessed shall be your offspring of your body and the produce of your ground and the offsprings of your beasts and the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Blessed you shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed you shall be when you come in and blessed you shall be when you go out. And on and on and on it goes all the way to verse 15. God promises all these, these blessings because when we obey him, he's, he's showing us a better way to live. Um, and by living a righteous life, good things happen. You see, God knows the future and so when we do these things that are disobedient to God, there are natural consequences to that, things that suck because God knows it's not good for you. But on the other hand, when we do obey God, there's natural blessings that come from that. There are things that are good for you, and in the long run, it will be better for you, even if it doesn't seem like so much fun right now.
So if that's true, so why, why don't we do it? Because um, God, I really look at it, you know, God's telling me to love my neighbors, uh, love my coworkers at work, and to share the gospel with them. Those are two things that I feel like he really wants me to do, you know, because I'm with these people eight hours a day, you know, five days a week. I spend the most time with them, besides my wife, I guess, in Charlotte, um, throughout the entire week. And yet, they're, I'm always so like kind of an arm's distance from them. I'm never really sharing the gospel with them, never really loving them. So why don't I do it if I know it's what God wants me to do, and if I know it's ultimately for my benefit as well? Well, let me share with you some of the reasons why I feel like I don't, and you can see if you can connect with me on some of these. The first one is that I'm, I'm selfish. I think... I could get to know my coworker better today and show them how much I really care about them while introducing them to Jesus, Savior of the world and of my very soul, or I could shy away from this really awkward conversation right now because I just don't like it. And we could talk about the weather instead. I'm selfish. I, I, I want my desires above what, what God desires for me. I'm prideful. I honestly think that I'm, I'm better or above some people which is horrible to say, but it's true. For example, a, a friend or a coworker comes up to me and they says, oh yeah, like we totally got drunk last weekend and yeah, I went to this party and got laid like four times and oh yeah, we went to the bar and just when we just got so wasted, we fell down on the street. And I think, wow, man, that's really sinful. Like I would never do that. I can never go out with them and do those things with them. But in reality, am I really any better um, just because their sin's different than mine, I can't really compare it that way. My sin's just as awful, if not even worse. And is it not possible for me to actually spend time with them at, let's say, like a bar or a party and not do those things? Sure, the temptation's there, but I'm, I'm sure it's possible for me to do that. I'm prideful. I think I'm better than them. Or I'm too busy. I don't go out of my way to obey God. I just kind of wait for when it's convenient for me. I think... I could go walk with that coworker tonight who's really lonely and, and likes to go on walks and has gone on walks with me before and get to know him better and, and spend time with him outside of work and just talk. But I have dinner plans tonight, and even though those two things don't, uh, they're not at the same time, and I could do both in one night, I don't want to do too much today. I'm just too busy. Because sometimes it's just like God provides me an, an opportunity He's opening up these doors for me to, to witness to people, to, to share love with them, to do the things that God tells me to do. And then I tell God, you know, I'm sorry, I got plans. Not tonight, God, maybe next week, maybe never. Okay, bye. Um, and I'm sure there are other reasons for sure that I don't do things. But it, for me, these three are the ones that are usually in the way. If I'm completely honest, those are the three that get in my way. And I'm sure everybody has their three, if not four, five, six, seven maybe just one. Um, and so I'm sure you have your own list of reasons why you don't. And I justify it to myself and I justify it to others. And I say all kinds of excuses like, oh, like, you know, somebody will come and say, hey, I was talking with your coworker today. I'm like, yeah, I didn't do that. I was, you know, too busy. Um, when in all reality, that could, it's a lie. I had time. I could have made time. Could have gone out of my way to do those things. So God sees my heart and he knows my real motives. He looks more than just the action. The worst part about not obeying him is, is that I don't obey to, to stay kind of happy, to kind of like please myself. Um, but all I end up doing is make myself miserable. And so when I'm, when I'm serving others, I, I'm always just going to be, or I'm serving myself, I'm always going to be miserable. And I kind of trap myself in this mindset that everything is about me. When in reality... I'm supposed to love God and listen to what he says. He says to love other people, to care about more people even more than myself. And I don't, I don't want you guys to feel like I'm just kind of like, you should do this, um, you know, and just kind of hammering away um, and trying to make you feel guilty. Because um, I don't want you to make the same mistake that I make when, when I feel that way and get stuck, get my arm caught in the slide. Don't burden yourself with being perfect because it's just not going to happen. Don't listen to the lies that if you do one thing wrong, you're off the wagon and have to start all over. Because Jesus died so that we might enjoy God's grace. God knows we make mistakes, so don't wallow in it like I have in the past. 
but confess your mistakes, be reconciled to the Lord, push forward, and continue to do good. Because God's like a good basketball player, or good basketball coach, sorry. Uh, and a good coach teaches his players to shoot baskets, of course. You know, I don't know anything about basketball, but I know that they are trying to get the ball in the basket. Um, <laughs> but he also teaches them to rebound. When you miss, pick it up and stick it back in. Because a lot of times, you know, you know you're going to miss, and the rebound's just as crucial as the initial shot. And because God's just like a good basketball coach, he knows that you're going to miss. He knows you're going to screw up. He knows he's going to give you an opportunity to witness somebody, and you're going to completely blow it off and drop the ball. But he also is looking at that rebound. He's looking to see what you do with that, what you do with that mistake. Are you just going to leave it there and wallow at it and cry about it? Or are you going to say, God, I'm sorry. Here, let me try to, to do my best from here forward. He knows that you're not perfect, and that's why he died for you. And this kind of brings me to the, the purpose of obedience. Because, see, God didn't die for us so that we can, we can be perfect or get as close to perfect as possible before we leave this earth, um, which is a mistake that I make a lot where I think, yeah, like, God saved me, and now my job is to get as close to looking like Jesus as I can before I leave, um, and just looking perfect. And that's not... That's not what he did. He saved us for a purpose, and that purpose is our mission. It's our ministry. It's to reconcile others to God, to, to restore that relationship between other people and, and Jesus, just like others did for me. They came and they showed me, and they, they preached the word to me, and I realized that God loves me and that there is so much more to this life than me. And that's by, we do that by spreading the gospel. When I say spreading the gospel, I don't just mean just going out and preaching it. Um, there's so many other ways to spread the gospel, and everything that you do matters for that. So we're going to jump back to Matthew 5 quick here. Um, so hopefully you kept your place, but if not, that's okay. I forgot to tell you. Um, Matthew 5, verse 14 and 16, through 16, sorry. And this is Jesus talking again. He says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And that, that last verse, that, that verse 16, is what really hits me and what reminds me of what the purpose of obedience is. The purpose of obedience is to lead other people to God. It's so that way they can see the good works that God tells me to do, and, and in response, they'll glorify God. They'll see something different. Because when we, when we live just like the world and claim to be believers, we're cheapening grace. Because something has to change when we become a believer, and it does. We start to follow God's way and not our own anymore. And too often, I really don't believe this. I I foolishly think that my walk with Jesus, my prayer life, my faithfulness, my actions, my attitude, my motives only affect me and maybe my relationship with Jesus. When in reality, they affect everybody around me. When I'm praying for people, God moves. When I'm doing the things that God tells me, God moves. When my attitude is something that God commands me to have, when I'm thankful, when I'm full of joy, even though hard times come, God moves because of that. So everything that I do, because God directs me in all aspects of my life, is a ministry for Jesus. And I should really take it more, more seriously. Um, so in closing, I just wanted to just kind of recap. We looked at um, what obedience is. It's so much more than just the physical actions uh, it's so much more than that. It's the, it's the heart. It's the attitude behind that. And there's all these things that are enclosed in, in obedience and in, in following what God tells you to do. And we looked at why we do things. And as so we say, okay, there's all these really good reasons why I should obey God, and there's all these really bad reasons why I don't. 
And then we looked at, at purpose. Purpose is so much more than, than me becoming perfect. It's, it's so much more than, than me having a right relationship with God um, and obeying Him. It's because there's a greater purpose in that. That's outside of me. The focus isn't on me. It's about other people. It's about bringing them to Christ. And so everything we do is important, and everything has an impact from the private prayer in your head to dying as a martyr before others. And so I, I know that was kind of seems kind of short, um, but that's all I had this morning. So if you'll join me with the word of prayer. Uh, Father God, I thank you so much uh, just for this opportunity to speak again, God. God, I thank you for just, um, just the reality of what uh, the purpose of obeying you is, God. God, I pray that um, we, can, we can turn our focus off of, off of ourselves, God, and put our focus on you. Um, God, I pray that you would just inspire us and, and encourage us, Lord, to, to do the things that you tell us to do with a right heart and with a right attitude, God. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.